Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to, uh, oh my gosh, what is this program? We've had so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, Citizen's Guide to Massachusetts Real Estate Law with Richard Howe. Um, my name is Mina Jane, and as I said, I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library, and I'm really thrilled to have Dick Howe back here. He was here in January to talk about the researching your old house, and that was a wonderful presentation. So um, I just want to let you know to put questions in the chat, and I will be feeding them to Dick as he does his presentation, and then of course we'll have a Q&A at the end. And um, we are recording this. It will be on our YouTube channel later. And as always, I'd like to thank the Library Foundation, the Cary Library Foundation, for supporting all of our adult programs. So without further ado, I'm going to do a quick introduction and then hand it over to Dick Howe. Um, Richard Howe has served as Register of Deeds for the Middlesex North District since 1995 and practiced law for eight years before that. He's a past president of the Massachusetts Registers of Deeds Associations and has written and lectured frequently on Massachusetts real estate law and history. He is also a professor at UMass Lowell, where my son is a graduate. <laughs> so I had to throw that in. So please welcome Dick Howe. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for having me, and thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, real estate law is, it's, I find it a very, I find it a fascinating topic, but what I find almost even more fascinating is everybody has an interest in real estate either they own property or they rent but everybody has to live somewhere and so it's a central part of our lives but um, so few people understand how it works um, i think i think most americans know more about uh, the intricacies of their cable tv bill than they do about how they own the most valuable asset in their uh, portfolio for, for most people. So what I'm going to do for the next uh, 45 minutes or so is really jam a, a one year long law school class in real estate law into 45 minutes. But I'm going to touch upon the, the higher the concepts. And I think if we were in person, uh, it would be a lot of opportunities for back and forth interaction because um, some topics might suggest a follow up from you. Uh, and so I'd like to make this as interactive as possible and Mina will monitor the chat session. So with that, I'm going to um, share my screen. I've got a, um, a set of slides that I'm going to use to, um, to go through the talk. And what I've, I've found is that when people think about how they own their property, they usually take how they own their motor vehicle, their car, and apply the same concepts. So in this slide, you see the, somebody's automobile and the, at least part of the certificate of title. So think about when you buy a car, if you pay cash for it, the Registry of Motor Vehicles issues a certificate of title to you. If you finance the purchase of your car, you don't get that certificate of title, that official document. Um, it's, uh, it's really, it's sent to the uh, lien holder, GMAC or Ford Motor Credit or whatever. And then when you finally, um, when you finally pay off the loan, the title is released to you. And when it comes time for you to sell the car, you turn it over, you turn the title over and you sign the back and you endorse it to whoever the new owner is going to be and you give it to them. Well, people think real estate documents and real estate law works the same way. And so uh, before the pandemic, when uh, a lot more people were coming into the registry of deeds, it was almost a daily occurrence when someone would come walking in and they'd uh, justifiably with pride announce I've just paid off my mortgage now please give me my deed or I want my deed and we have to say as well uh, we don't have your deed it actually should have been returned to you shortly after you bought your house and whether or not you have a mortgage doesn't really have any effect on um, the status of your deed and this is one of my all-time favorite quotes it's from 
uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And he said, on this point, a page of history is worth a volume of logic. And by that, um, I, I think he means that this topic doesn't really make any sense unless you understand the history, because if you were creating a land record system today from scratch, it wouldn't be the system we use today. But our system has evolved over um, almost a millennium, uh, at least six or 700 years, because our real estate law came from England. And so that's where I'm going to start talking about. But first, a public service announcement about what I call federalism. And this is a really important thing to understand when you're thinking about real estate law. And by federalism, I mean that um, you know certain um, certain authority is granted to the federal government by the U.S. Constitution, but if it's not specifically granted, it's reserved to the states. And one of the things that's reserved to the states is real estate law. And so the law of Massachusetts varies from the law of New Hampshire or the law of Rhode Island. And this becomes um, an even bigger issue in the age of the internet because sometimes people want to engage in self-help. Uh, for instance, if the taillight of my car is out, I can't go out right now and replace the, the bulb. But what I've done in the past is I go to trust the YouTube and I Google the kind of car I have and taillight and somebody shows me how to replace the bulb and I do it. Well, the problem with doing something like that with creating a, a real estate document is that it might apply to another state and companies that pre that prepare like generic real estate documents try to find some sort of middle ground that would work in most states they don't specify that or give you a warning they just sort of put it out there and because massachusetts has been around for so long and our real estate law is so old it is quite different than what you'd find in most of the rest of the country and so uh, that's just a kind of a word of warning when you go online to research something about real estate, uh, just make sure it's Massachusetts specific and it's not just a generic um, um, United States real estate law. So let's jump back uh, almost a thousand years back into medieval times in England. Uh, and that's when people were first able to buy and sell real estate. Uh, prior to that, the king owned everything, and we'll talk a little bit about how that worked, but then gradually people began to own real estate themselves, and they had the right to transfer it to whomever they wanted. And the way that real estate was sold is the parties to the transaction, the buyer and the seller, would go out onto the land, the seller would pick up a twig or a piece of turf and hand it over to the buyer. And that handing over of that piece of the ground symbolized the transfer of ownership. And keep that concept in mind as we go through this talk because it's a concept that continues on today, just that it's a little different. Now eventually, um, this going out on the land and handing over the twig was memorialized in writing. And that written document became uh, known as a deed. But it was just a memo that that um, kind of put down on paper uh, a, a, a summary or a snapshot of what happened in real life, the, the people going out, handing over part of the land to the new owner. Well, I don't have any evidence to back this up, but it occurs to me that at one day it was pouring rain or the weather was nasty and somebody said do we really have to go out to the land can't we just stay here inside and hand over this piece of paper and I suspect that's how this trends uh, transition from going to the land to handing over the deed was made and that's what the deed symbolizes now so when you're buying a house you go to the lawyer's office or you used to go to the registry deeds, you might go somewhere else. And you're really um, having a hard time paying attention because there's probably like 40 different papers you have to sign. 
and you're too busy signing them to take a step back and look at the big picture. Um, but the big picture is um, sort of a, a in, inside, in the office, duplication of going out into the land. Now, there are, in Massachusetts, there are three types of deeds, and these names get kind of kicked around a lot. And the one in the middle, quit claim deed, is the one um, most commonly used. It, and when it's said rapidly, some people think it, it, it's quick, as in rapid deed, but it's quit claim. And the difference between the three is the, um, the type of promise um, or covenant that the seller makes to the buyer. Um, now in Massachusetts, the quit claim deed is the one used, mo used most commonly. In fact, it, it's a quit claim deed is almost like a single term. A quit claim deed is a standard deed in Massachusetts. And the significance of the word quit claim is that it, it kind of relates back to a particular statute in Massachusetts law. And what that means is that the seller promises to the buyer that he, the seller, has um, owns the property, it's not subject to any encumbrances, and if there are any encumbrances, like a lien or a mortgage, um, he'll defend the property against the claimant. Um, now, a warranty deed is a higher level of the, the promise that the seller makes is that it, it, he, he promises that there aren't any claims that he made, but also that nobody who owned the land before him ever made. And so it's very rare to use the warranty deed because why promise something about something that happened hundreds of years ago? So that's hardly ever used in Massachusetts. Um, and a release deed is just, a, you're getting what you get. I'm not making any promises about anything. So that's used very rarely. Now, as an example of uh, federalism, I'm up here in Lowell. We're only 15 miles from the New Hampshire border. And I've actually been licensed to practice law in New Hampshire for a long time. And in, in New Hampshire, excuse me, the, um, in New Hampshire, a warranty deed is... Sorry about that. I muted my cell phone, but I, I'm also at home, so I didn't know how to mute my, uh, my home phone. Um, so yeah, in New Hampshire, a warranty deed is what a quick claim deed is in Massachusetts. But that's a little bit too much down in the weeds for all of you. But just remember, when you hear a quick claim deed, there's nothing special about it. It's just a regular Massachusetts deed. Now, the three italicized words I have at the bottom are probably the more important thing from this slide. And it's the, the three things that are sort of the essential elements of selling a piece of real estate. The first is there has to be a document, um, and it has to be in writing. Um, now, since 2005 in Massachusetts, that writing does not have to be on piece of, a piece of paper and the document doesn't have to be in tangible form. Uh, it was in that year that the uh, state legislature passed what's called the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. And that law uh, was what's called an overlay law. It didn't change a whole bunch of other things like it didn't say a deed can be electronic or a signature on a deed can be electronic but the way it approached it was it said any other law that requires a document to be in writing is satisfied by the electronic version of that writing and it said that any other law that requires something to be signed is complied with by an electronic signature, whatever form that takes. But for most of us, the deed still is a piece of paper with an ink signature on it. Uh, the next important element is delivery. You have to hand the deed over to the new owner. Um, and 
Yes, yeah, pretty straightforward at a typical real estate closing. The, the document gets signed by you and then it's slid across the table to the new owner or the new owner's attorney. Um, but that delivery then has to be done with the intent to transfer ownership. For instance, if I'm at the registry of deeds and I have the deed and uh, it's granting the property to you, but we're not sure whether the deal is going to go through because you might not have all the money you need. And I uh, hand the deed over to you and I say, here, please take a look at this and make sure everything's okay. And um, I'm going to come back in a few minutes and we'll see whether we can finalize the transaction. Well, when I come back, you say, oh, I own the property now. You gave me the deed. You delivered it to me. I'm the new owner. Well, I handed it to you physically, but I didn't do it with the intent to transfer ownership to you. So to make an effective transfer of ownership of real estate, those three things have to come together. It has to be a document in writing, it has to be delivered, it has to be delivered with the intent to transfer ownership. Now, now we'll talk a little bit about the purpose of the registry of deeds. Uh, the deed has been transferred. The new owner has it. He got it with the intent to transfer ownership. Well, he now owns the property. Uh, the document does not have to be recorded to transfer ownership. It happens upon the delivery. And the general rule in real estate law, it, 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 it's kind of archaic language. First in time is first in right which means that if I, I own property, I want to pull a scam and I'm going to try to sell it to two different people so that I can get um, double my money and then I'll flee the jurisdiction. I sign one deed, I give it to person A at nine o'clock in the morning. I sign a second deed and give it to person B at 10 o'clock in the morning. As between A and B, a owns the property because A's deed came first in time. But the purpose of recording the deed is to make a public record of who owns what. And the law gives priority to a recorded deed over an earlier unrecorded deed. So to continue with my hypothetical, I give A one deed at eight and nine o'clock in the morning and B an exact duplicate of that deed, except it's transferring it to B at 10 o'clock. A didn't go directly to the registry of deeds. A celebrated his new purchase by going to a coffee shop and killing some time. B at 10 o'clock went right to the registry of deeds, looked at the record, showed there was no prior transactions in the, in the recordings recorded the deed, A came sometime after that. And so even though A received his deed earlier than B had, because B had recorded the document first, B would be the owner as against A. So um, I'm going to just take a breath. Any, any questions? If uh, I'll take silence as a no. <laughs> Hi, Dick. Uh, there is a question from Denise, but it's about homesteading. I don't know if you have chat open. Um, it's, it's I did, but it's um, it, it kind of went away when I slared my, shared my slide. Um, oh, okay. I can read it for to you. Okay. Okay. Um, here's a, she's a homesteading question. Uh, married older spouse already has homestead on file. Now, second spouse filing homestead form says, I insert name of owner or we in state names of owners. I'm assuming you just put the record second spouse's name, not both, even though owned jointly. And will they notarize at the registry? Uh, so the. Um... So the, I think to answer the, first, the last part first, uh, I doubt that the people at the registry will notarize the document. Um, we used to do it routinely, but we uh, were under 
some restrictions about how much and how long we can interact with people who come in. And so because of the pandemic restrictions, um, I suspect that the, the registry would not do um, the acknowledgement. So you'd have to find a notary public elsewhere. Um, as for um, the homestead for the, uh, the so-called elderly person, the person above age 62, um, it, it, that's, it's kind of tricky. And I actually have a slide on the homestead coming up. And so I think what I'd like to do is to defer answering that part of the question until I get to that. And um, I'll stop at the end of what I have to say about homesteads. And if I haven't answered the question, we can just repeat it. And I suspect we'll have some other questions because homestead's always a topic. Uh, that people have a lot of interest in it. So yeah. Denise said that was fine, that when you get to homesteading, could you ask that, answer that question? Sure thing. Okay, pressing on. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of, fan of Downton Abbey, but I, I guess I watched enough of it to, to know that it might be um, relevant to this part of the talk. Uh, and again, I'm talk, this stuff is all sort of high level, but it's, it, it, I think if you hear it, um, it really helps you understand how the system works. And so our, our system of owning real estate is, um, it's about how long you own the property for. And so the first type of ownership, fee simple, it's potentially infinite. If you live forever, you would own the property forever. So nothing happens to cut short your ownership unless you do it yourself or you die. Now, the second type of ownership, fee tail, it's a kind of an, uh, an older method. It's actually um, not really recognized in Massachusetts anymore. The law changed maybe 40 or 50 years ago. But what it means is that you own the property but it has to go to your descendants so that when you die, um, your heir, usually your oldest child would get it. Now they have a thing called fee tail male, which means that your oldest male child. And I think in England, in the time of Downton Abbey, um, the male part was included in it. And so if any of you watched the program, um, the, the guy in the middle of the slide, uh, Lord Grantham, had three daughters. He had no sons. And so there's kind of a crisis about what would happen when he died because the, his wife and the, um, the three daughters would basically be dispossessed of the property because it would pass on to a male heir. And um, he didn't have one. So um, that was an, an issue. Um, so fee tail is sort of an old, and, and just from my kind of garbled description of that, you can see what a mess it causes. So that's one of the reasons the state legislature um, kind of did away with it. Uh, the next type, it's called a fee simple determinable. And this is less than complete ownership. It usually doesn't, and, and this is still relevant today, it doesn't usually apply like when you buy a house, but it, it, it comes up often with um, like a property that might have been granted to the town of Lexington on the condition that it be used for public recreational purposes. Um, so there's a condition in that deed that, that restricts the use of this property. So what happens if it's not going to be used for recreational purposes anymore? Well, what happens is the grant gets revoked. Um, another example might be somebody granted um, property to a, a congregation, a religious congregation, on the condition that the property be used for a church. Well, maybe everybody who attended that church moved away or they don't practice that um, variety of religion anymore. And the property is just sitting there and, the, uh, and the, the remnants of the congregation want to sell it to somebody. Well, they really can't because in selling it, if it's not going to be used as a, a house of worship, um, the original transfer gets revoked. 
Now, the fourth type of ownership is a life estate. And that's actually very common today as part of estate planning. A life estate is ownership me measured by the life of a person. And so what typically happens is uh, maybe a, a, a couple uh, gets older, um, the, uh, the, the husband uh, might pass away and uh, the, the um, wife survives um, and uh, they have one child between them and, and they always wanted that child to become the owner of the real estate. Well, uh, the, the mother can go to a lawyer and say, I'd like to live there the rest of my life, but then I'd like my daughter to become the owner of the house. Well, the lawyer would create a deed that would say, mother grants the property to herself for her life. And then upon her death, it goes to the daughter. And once that's signed and then recorded, uh, daughter actually owns an interest in the property. If you jump down to the bottom, the word future, words future interest. Um, so daughter has something of value and the value is she's gonna become the owner of the property when mother dies. Now, if mother is 55 years old, um, the, the value of the daughter's interest is less than if mother was 95 years old, just based on life expectancy. But there's this kind of split ownership. So for as long as mother is alive, she owns the property. She has the exclusive right to use it, to be on it. But if she decided, I'm tired of the cold weather up here, I wanna to go to Florida, I'm gonna sell my house. All she would have to sell is her life estate. Now she could sell it to somebody else, but that would mean they would only own the property for as long as mother was alive. Um, and that's really not practical. So what would happen is mother and daughter would have to join in, in a, both sign a deed, both relinquish their interests, the mother's present interest in the life estate and the daughter's future interest in that um, ownership after the mother's passing. Uh, and so that's used a lot because today even um, because it, it the, the property would pass on to the uh, person that holds the future interest without the need to, to go through the probate process. Now, an estate for years is just a fancy term for a lease. If you rent a, um, you're a small business person, you rent a storefront, you uh, rent it for five years, that's an estate years. You basically own that space for the term of the lease. If it's a month-to-month -month lease, you own it for month-to-month. -month. Um, what happens when your lease is up? It reverts back to the landlord, so the landlord retains a future interest, or really the, the right to get the possession of the property back. In a state at sufferance is somebody who doesn't have a lease, who doesn't have any right to be there. Um, but they still occupy the property. Uh, you, you really have to like go into court to evict somebody like that. You just can't go in and change the locks and move them out. And that will come up again when I'm talking about foreclosures. All right, so moving on, um, you can more than two people, more than one person can own property together. There are three types of joint ownership in Massachusetts. And the characteristic that distinguishes them is whether or not there's a right of survivorship between the joint owners. So in tenants in common, which is sort of the most basic way of owning property, um, each tenant in common owns part of the property. So let's say it's two people, um, they own property as tenants in common. One of them dies, the deceased half of the property would pass through the decedent's estate. It wouldn't go to the co-owner unless that's what the decedent's will directed. There's no automatic transfer of the property to the surviving co-owner. So that's something that might come up in like a, a business type of arrangement of two people going to business together and they buy real estate and they don't incorporate, they just want to own the property as individuals, they would retain the property as tenants in common because 
if either of them passed away, they would want their interest to go to their um, their relatives. Uh, the next two have a right of survivorship. The first I'll talk about is joint tenants. Um, so A grants to B and C as joint tenants. The relevance of joint tenants is that if B dies, C automatically owns the entire property without doing anything. There's no inheritance, there's nothing passes. Um, with joint tenants, they each own the whole thing subject only to the other's corresponding interest. interest. So when one dies, that person's interest is extinguished along with their life and their survivor is the sole owner of the property. Tenants by the entirety is a lot like that. It has the right of survivorship, but it's also reserved for married couples. So um, two people get married, one spouse dies, they own their property as tenants by the entirety. Um, the surviving spouse automatically owns the whole thing. Now, the difference between joint tenants and tenants by the entirety is that um, for the, the type of ownership reserved for spouses, there's, there's some protection for um, each spouse from the creditors of the other spouse. So that's kind of embedded in there. And that, it's sort of a throwback to an earlier era where uh, the, the male owned most of the, owned the property and uh, it was intended to, to protect the, the wife. Um, we live in a, a more egalitarian society now, so it's not as, as big a deal and it, it protects against the debts of either spouse. And there's some overlap with the homestead, which I'm gonna to get to shortly. Now what I've got the image at the bottom of the slide is the top part of the death certificate. I said that with joint tenants and tenants by the entirety, when one of the co-owners dies, the other automatically owns the property. That happens the instant the co-owner dies, but there should be a showing in the records at the Registry of Deeds that the circumstances have changed. And the way you do that is you record a copy of the death certificate of the deceased co-owner. And that shows in the record um, that the surviving co-owner is the sole owner of the property. Uh, here we are, Declaration of Homestead. So Declaration of Homestead really goes back almost to colonial times. And the whole purpose of it is to keep people from being thrown out of their residence because of their debts. Now in Massachusetts, you have an automatic homestead that protects, I think it's 25,000 or $50,000 in the equity of your home. But you can enhance that, no, sorry, it's $125,000. Um, you can enhance that and bump it up to $500,000 in protection by recording a declaration of homestead at the Registry of Deeds. It's a pretty simple form. You just put your name, the address, the reference to the book and page number of your deed, you sign it, you have your signature notarized, and you record the document. Now, this does not prevent you from incurring debts. If you go out and charge, uh, max out all your credit cards and don't pay, and you get sued by the, the um, credit card companies, uh, you still owe them the money. Um, but by recording the declaration of homestead, it protects your home. So if you didn't have a homestead and you incurred a big debt, you had a judgment against you, your creditor could force the sale of your house and use the proceeds of that sale to pay off the debt. Um, with the homestead, the family residence is taken out of that pool of assets that can be used to satisfy the debt. So if you own a vacation home or a rental property or you have a lot of money in the bank, your creditor can still get to that, but um, uh, not your, your residence. Um, now, when married couple owns property, they both must sign the homestead. Um, and um, there's also uh, a homestead for what's called the elderly and disabled. And it defines elderly as 62 years or older. Um, and the difference between the elderly homestead and the regular homestead comes up with, um, with married couples. 
with a regular homestead, the, the two spouses split the $500,000 exemption. So that if both were sued into, individually and both had a judgment um, against them, um, they would each only have $250,000 protection in the home. Now, if you're elderly, each spouse who is 62 or older has the $500,000. So you basically um, doubling the level of protection you have. And so if two spouses are both 62 and they record a homestead on the form, it checks a box, there's a box that says check here if you're 62 or older. Now, the question comes up a lot, what happens when somebody that already owns property and is under the age of 62 turns 62? Um, and that's one of these really ambiguous areas in the law uh, that I don't have a clear answer to. Um, I think that if uh, a married couple, one's 63, one's 58, they file a homestead, the form is such that you can indicate which of them is over 62 and that person would have their protection and then I think the other spouse would have the normal protection. So that would be a case where you'd probably have this kind of stacking of the $500,000. Um, if somebody turns 62, I don't think it's advisable to go in and file a new homestead, um, but uh, I really can't give you legal advice. And one of the reasons I can't answer that question more clearly is, uh, I compare having a homestead to having a big mean dog in your house, that if somebody comes to your door and tries to break in and you hear the dog barking inside, they're likely gonna move on to a softer target, not bother your house. And if they're determined enough to get into your house, they can spend enough time and effort and get in. And the homestead works a little bit like that, that if somebody recovers a judgment against you and they see that you have a homestead, um, they're likely just going to not chase after your house. They're not going to pursue it and try to um, nibble around the edges about how much equity you have. Uh, and and um, in that way, it's like the barking dog. Now, if they want to, and they want to spend enough money and legal fees to try to um, litigate how much coverage you get from the homestead, they can do that. But I don't think anybody's actually done it and it's never been appealed. And that's why we don't have a, an appellate court case that gives us any more clarity on it. So I don't know if that, um, if there are any other homestead questions, I'll just take a, a quick pause here. No, not hearing any, I'll move on. Okay. Um, hold on one second. Um, yep. Let's see, Denise uh, followed up with that. So when the second spouse filling homestead form says, I insert my name or we insert our names, I'm assuming you just put the second spouse's name, not both, not even jointly, not even though jointly owned. So just the second person filing at this point, leave off the name of the spouse that already filed. Um, well, no, I, I think you, you'd, so the, the form calls for both spouses to declare the homestead and to sign it. And then about midway through the form, it says, check here if you're 62 or older. And I think the spouse who is now 62 would check that box and put that spouse's name in it. The other spouse's name would not go in there. Um, I don't know if having that spouse unilaterally record the homestead, a new homestead, I think that might raise a whole series of other problems because the law is pretty clear that says that a married couple should record the homestead together. And again, it's sort of, sort of ambiguous, but doing the way I describe it probably eliminates the risk of not having the married couple record the form together, but it also allows you to identify that one of the spouses is 62 or older by checking off that particular box. So I think that's the best way. That would probably be the most logical way to handle it. I, if you're going to record, record the new one anyway, you, you probably ought to do it in accordance with the law, which says both names have to go on it. Okay. I have a question. Um, it's about the homestead. We own um, a second home that we rent to our son. Can we 
should we do a home? Can we do a homestead act uh, on the second home, or because we rent it, we can? Um, well, I mean to be precise, you can, but it wouldn't have any benefit because it's not it's not your primary residence. It's it, remember that the whole purpose of the homestead is to keep you from having to move out into the street when a creditor sells your house out from under you. Okay. Uh, it, but and, they could still go after the second house. That was my concern. Right, because it's a it's not your residence. Now it okay. your yours it, it might feel like a, an appendage to your residence because your son's living there, but um, it, legally it's not. He's just he's the equivalent of a tenant in a rental property. So should he have a homestead that is that I don't know that he has he, he doesn't have any equity in the home to protect. He just it's a place to live. Okay, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let, me, have... let me just interject. Now, a homestead is like in no way a replacement for insurance. You should have, you know, a, a very comfortable level of liability insurance on any house or property you own. It's almost like just this homestead, it's very affordable to record the form is only $35 and you do it once. And um, it's like, there's no downside to doing it, so everybody should do it. Um, so we do have a bunch of questions. If you want to take a little uh, break from the presentation, sure Virginia, thing. So Virginia asks, can you file the homestead at the same time as the deed, so you have protection over the house from the get-go? Yes, you can. Um, you have to file it as a separate form. Um, the, the form calls for the book and page number of the deed. So when you record a document, we, we used to put them in physical books and we'd number the books and the pages. And so it's essentially an ID D number. When you're recording it with the deed, you won't know the book and page number of the deed. So you just write, you know, recorded herewith is usually what happens. So yeah, that would be an effective thing to do. Okay. And the second part um, from Virginia is, what's the difference between an attachment versus a lien on a house from a creditor? I, if you bear with me, that's another slide a okay. couple down the road, so I'll get to that. So um, I'm going to go back to this one. I'd like for Richard to talk about potential conflicts of interest, specifically when developers and real estate agents hold positions on zoning boards and other town committees. <laughs> I believe town meeting members are not subject to conflict of interest law. Is that correct? Um, I, I think that's correct. I confess to living in the city of Lowell where we don't have town meeting. So um, I'm not, um, I, I don't know that for sure. I don't, I don't think a town meeting member is. I believe a member of the board of select men would be. Um, I am in my position because it's an elected office. Um, as for developers being on the planning board or the board of appeals, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think they they would be held by some kind of a, a, a standard where you couldn't act on your own your own thing. Um, I I suppose there's always suspicion that even if the the developer board member excludes him or herself that uh, the colleagues on the board might be more deferential to a colleague's proposal than to just somebody that came walking in but um yeah i um i'm chuckling because i can see that politics in lexington isn't any different than politics in lowell <laughs> oh well i don't know if that's good or bad <laughs> um so denise is still at uh I think, um, wondering about this uh, homesteading thing. She says, so it, is, is the second spouse covered if first spouse has already filed or the second one, the first spouse? Who, Denise, do you want to unmute and ask directly because um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm muddling your question. Or another, another option, and anybody can do this, my the email address I use, it's lowelldeeds at comcast.net. So that's lowelldeeds at comcast.net. And I get the answers, I get the emails on my phone, I get them at work, and I'd be happy to 
answer any questions you have, particularly if they're more individual to your circumstances. And I could probably do a more comprehensive job and send you a, a handout or something along with it. Okay. So I might okay. recommend just as soon as the presentation's done, just send me an email at lowelldeeds at comcast.net with the particular concern you have, and I'll get right back to you. Okay. So Denise doesn't have a microphone. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to repeat her part of qu the question and see if um, she can, if we can understand it. So this is, so is the second spouse covered if first spouse already filed or the second one and the first spouse redoes it? So, um, so there was a big change in the homestead law in 2011 and it was a 180 degree change because before 2011, only one spouse was entitled to record a homestead, uh, but it protected both spouses. For instance, I, the house I'm living in, we purchased in 1995. I was married, I'm still married to the same person. Uh, we recorded a homestead, I signed in 1995. I haven't changed that. However, in 2011, the law pivoted and said that if you're a married couple and you declare a homestead, both spouses have to declare the homestead together. Now, it, it and that's what the law says. Now, if, if only one spouse has recorded a homestead and it's from before 2011, it's uh, autumn, the, the law specifically says it's like brought forward, it's okay, you don't have to redo it. If you recorded a homestead yesterday, your husband and wife, you both own the property, only one of you recorded the homestead, almost regardless of the age, um, I'd be a little concerned about that because I think the law says you both have to declare the homestead. Um, so uh, it's, it's really hard to answer the question because um, the, the, neither the law nor court cases have addressed that particular issue. And I'm kind of just speculating or guessing what the answer might be. Okay. Well, Denise said that if she has additional questions on that topic, she'll email you. Great. Um, Marilyn wants to know, if you can't locate the deed to your home, how do you get a new one? Um, it, you can just get it from the, the registry of deeds. Uh, there's a, a, a central website, it's called masslandrecords.com. And if you go there, it displays a map of Massachusetts with each registry of deeds highlighted. And you click on that and it takes you to that registry's website and almost all of them, certainly the two in Middlesex County, you can get your deed quite easily. You can download it and you don't need like the physical document. The, it, it's not, again, it, just to, back to the beginning, it's not like the certificate of title to your car. If you don't have the original deed, the transferred ownership to you in your possession, don't worry about it. You don't need it when it comes time to sell your house. Um, you don't even need a copy from the registry of deeds. What you do need is some of the information that was on the recorded deed. And um, the best way to get the information is to actually get a copy of what was recorded. But, but you don't need to have something you can physically hold in your hand. Hmm. So this is an interesting question. Um, what if two unrelated people own a property? How does homesteading work in that situation? They would each they would each record a separate homestead because they each own a a, um, a separate interest in the property, and that would be the case even if they were joint tenants, because all that does is it creates that right of survivorship. It really doesn't change their relationship about about who owns what. So they they would each have sort of a separate interest in the property, so they could each record um, a homestead. Okay, um, and. Just a clarification question from Denise that it's okay to refile two spouses together, just refile. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's no, um, there, there's a, like the law specifically says that if you had a homestead and you record a new one, there's no gap in the coverage. It's not like it wipes out the prior one. The prior one continues right up until you record the new one. Okay, thank you. I mean, that. I think that answers all of our flurry of questions about homesteading. Thank you. You're welcome. I sometimes give 
talks entirely about the homestead. So I, I know that I moved the slide up further to the front of the presentation just for that reason. Um, mortgages. Uh, most people do get mortgages and um, there, it, it's important to understand how they work. So, we, and again, this is sort of unique to Massachusetts because it varies from state to state. When you hear the term mortgage in Massachusetts, it really talks about two separate but related things. One is a contract, and the contract is in the form of the promissory note. When you sit down at the real estate closing or at your refinancing, one document you sign is a note. And that's a contract between you and the lender. And the contract is the lender's giving you this amount of money and you're promising in return to pay it back over time with interest. That document, because it's a contract, does not get recorded at the registry of deeds. However, the security to the lender, you know, what, what happens if you break the contract and you don't pay the money back is the mortgage. And the mortgage is a type of deed and so you sign another document called the mortgage and it says I new homeowner grant to Bank of America with mortgage covenants the property in Lexington Massachusetts that's described as forward follows um, to ensure payment in accordance with a promissory note of today's date that mortgage gets recorded um, and it really doesn't have any effect on your deed. It's not like the title to your car where the lender's name is annotated on the back of it. Um, you get the property with the deed, you're the owner. But now as the owner, you've granted away an interest in the property to the lender. And the interest you've granted to the lender is the right to take away the property from you if you don't pay off the note. And I'll get into how that happens. Now, uh, a second footnote is whether you call it a home equity loan or a line of credit or a first mortgage or a second mortgage, they're all mortgages. They're all that same grant of an interest in real estate. Um, and that's the document that gets recorded. Some related documents, an assignment of the mortgage, you borrow money from the Lexington Savings Bank um, Lexington and Savings Bank can then transfer the right to receive your money to Bank of America. And, and they do that by recording an assignment of mortgage at the registry. A subordination is um, you have one mortgage and you're getting a second one, um, but the person that's loaning you the second amount of money wants to be in first place, wants to have priority if there's a foreclosure. Well, if the original mortgagee, the original lender, assents to that, um, that entity signs a document called a subordination that basically says, yeah, I realize we were the first one to have a mortgage, but we are willing to let the second person time-wise um, have the first shot if there's any foreclosure. Modification is usually it, it happens when you run into difficulty paying um, the mortgage, you negotiate with the lender and they agree to modify it to let you pay less on a monthly basis or something like that. And finally, there's the discharge of mortgage. You've paid off the mortgage. Um, that's not when you get your deed back because you've always had your deed. Uh, the way that's shown in the registry records is the lender creates a document that's called a discharge of mortgage, gives that to you, and you record that at the registry of deeds. However, some lenders will record it themselves. And way down the bottom, this is a fairly old discharge. I got a screenshot in the slide, and I highlighted in yellow the book and page number of the mortgage. So when the discharge gets recorded, we create a link between the discharge and the mortgage. So anybody looking at the mortgage would immediately see that it's been paid off. So that's how the system works. But what if you don't pay off your, your, your promissory note? You stop making payments, you're, you can't negotiate a, a modification. Uh, the lender sends you a letter, says you're in default. Um, there's a procedure called a, a 
order of notice that um, people who are on active duty in the military have certain rights um, to protect them against foreclosure. Um, so the order of notice comes at the beginning of the process that really only applies, everybody would get one, um, but it, it only is relevant if somebody's in the military. The lender schedules an auction at the property and there's an auction held right, right on the premises. Uh, there's a second means of foreclosure called entry and possession. Somebody actually walks into the front yard and says, okay, I'm taking possession of the property. They don't actually like change the locks or anything, but um, that's more of a symbolic taking possession. Uh, at some point after the auction, there's a foreclosure deed recorded in the registry of deeds. If the homeowner has not vacated the, process, the premises, the new owner um, has to evict them in housing court. Um, this thing, deficiency and surplus, it's sort of unique to Massachusetts. Let's say you owe only $100,000 to the creditor. They have an auction and it's a really nice property and they get $500,000 for the property. Well, they're supposed to take their 100,000 and then the surplus that remaining 400,000 is supposed to go to you as the former property owner. But what happens more often is there's a deficiency. You owe 300,000, but the property is now only worth 200. So that's what's realized at the sale. Um, that 200 gets applied to the debt of 300. So now there's a balance of 100 that's owed. Uh, the, the lender will sue you um, separately on a breach of contract claim for that deficiency, that $100,000. Um, REO is a term, it's, it stands for real estate owned by, usually means by the lender. Uh, most auctions, it's the bank that buys the property back and then the bank becomes the property owner. And it's only when they sell it to a third party that it sort of gets back in regular usage. Um, this was a really big deal from like 2009 to 2012. There was a, a, just a tremendous number of foreclosures from the collapse of the, the economy back then. And unfortunately, on October 17th, the moratorium on foreclosures and evictions is most likely going to end. And I think you're going to see uh, a tidal wave of um, new foreclosures coming in the fall and the winter. Um, so I think that'll have a, a negative effect on real estate, although real estate is doing much better now than it was a year ago. Property taxes, that's handled by the town, not the registry of deeds. They send you the bill. If you don't pay the bill, the town has an automatic lien on the property. Now, if you're ever looking at the registry records and you type your name and all the records with your name in them show up, you might see something called the municipal lien certificate. And because the word lien is in the title, you panic and you're like, wait a minute, I shouldn't have a lien on my property. Well, it's an unfortunate title for a document because it usually has nothing to do with a lien. It's just a statement by the town about whether there are any, are any outstanding taxes owed. When you buy a property or you refinance, the lender insists that you get and record a municipal lien certificate. And that's just really a certification by the town that the taxes are all paid up to date. And that's because if they're not, even if you were a new owner of the property, if the previous owner didn't pay his or her taxes, the town can still come in and take your property. Uh, they do that by filing a document called a notice of taking. And that's more like a super lien that sits there on the property for a long period of time. It can sit there indefinitely um, and, and it doesn't really end until either the taxes are paid or until the town or a successor to the town um, petitions the land court to foreclose the lien, to foreclosing your right to pay the taxes and get the property back. Uh, and that's a long process where I put tax title auction. Increasingly, towns in Massachusetts are auctioning off 
all of their tax properties to these private businesses, which then um, step into the shoes of the town and pursue the foreclosure of the tax liens. And uh, one thing important about it is it's a strict foreclosure, which means if you think back to what I talked about with the regular mortgage foreclosure, if there's a surplus, the property owner gets the surplus. That's not the case with a tax lien foreclosure. Um, a person could potentially lose a property worth hundreds of thousands of dollars for only a couple of hundred dollars in unpaid taxes. Yet if that lien is foreclosed and it's cut off, um, the new owner gets the property just for the hundreds of dollars that were owed in taxes and the owner of the property gets nothing. They lose it entirely. So it's kind of, uh, it, there can be some really inequitable results that occur, but that's kind of the way the law is. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, liens, a condominium association has an automatic lien for non-paid condo expenses. That's why when you're buying or um, refinancing with the condo, you often have to get a certificate from the condo association that says that there are no outstanding liens. Or there's no outstanding uh, condo fees that are unpaid. Mechanics lien, um, the, the state law gives somebody who provides goods or services on real estate a shortcut to getting a lien on the property. And they can just come into the registry of deeds and record a document saying that there's a contract, they have to do work and they haven't been paid. Um, and that establishes a lien on the property. A Liz pendants, it's Latin um, for notice of lawsuit. Uh, it might be a lawsuit that affects the ownership of the property. If you want to notify the world that you've got a claim against this property, you get a judge's permission to record a Liz pendants. Now, attachment and execution, these are the two that come up most often. Uh, let's say that you, you are a, you're a, a, some kind of service provider. Um, it, you provide a professional service to somebody, they didn't pay you. It wasn't work done on their house, so you can't get a mechanics lien and you file a lawsuit against them for breach of contract, they owe you $100,000 in unpaid fees. Well, you're concerned that the person's going to move away and you won't have a chance to collect your um, judgment that you expect to win at the close of the lawsuit. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so... You're babysitting us today. <laughs> Uh, hold on one second. Um, we do have a question from Virginia, if you have a second. Sure thing. Um, since you mentioned the real estate market this, ye this year versus last year, any predictions for what will happen in the future? I've read prices are high now, but also that the market is a bubble now, and that when it bursts, it'll be a long time before it comes back up again. What's your prediction or thoughts on this? So I, I think prices are way up now because... Uh, interest rates are just so low that you can borrow money essentially for nothing. Uh, I mean, I'm of the age to remember when mortgage rates were like 17 and 18 percent, which is just staggering to even think of it. Uh, but that's not the case now. And I think people believe real estate is a solid investment. <coughs> um, I do think that um, there's going to be a, uh, a flood of foreclosures once the moratorium is lifted because, uh, you know, there's a saying that the stock market is not the economy. And I just feel that life has changed so much that it's got to have an impact on an awful lot of people. And I just don't think we've seen that ripple through the rest of the economy yet. And so I think when that does happen, it will sort of reset the real estate market. Um, I don't, I don't think it'll plummet, um, th that the bottom will fall out of it. And I think if it goes down, I think it'll come back fairly quickly once, um, things stabilize, which unfortunately might not be to the middle or latter part of 2021. But I mean, all indications are that, that 
there wasn't a bubble. There's been a gradual increase in the price of real estate. I do find it hard to explain why the prices have gone up as much as they have during the pandemic. Um, I kind of attribute it just to the, the uh, ability to get a really affordable rate on a loan. And people look at whether they can afford the monthly payment, not the total amount that they're paying. So the, like the value of the property sort of takes a secondary place to how much they can, what their monthly payment's gonna be. So with a lower rate, you can afford to pay more for the house. So that's what I, I think is going on. I, I don't think there's just gonna be like a complete collapse of value. Um, I think there will be a lot of foreclosures that will sort of cause the market to reset a little bit. Um, but I don't see anything that'll cause a, a, a down period to go on for a long period of time. Any other questions? No, thank you though. That was super thorough. Okay. So again, back to the attachment. Guy owes you the money, he owns a house. You're afraid he's going to sell the house, take the cash from the sale of the house and move away. So you ask the judge for an attachment of real estate. You make the case to the judge that this is a pretty clear case. You got a contract, you haven't got payment. The judge authorizes the attachment. The attachment gets recorded. Now somebody could still buy that house, but they're gonna buy it subject to the attachment. So if they buy it, um, you could still go ahead and um, if you get the ultimate judgment, you'll be able to sell the house under, from out from under the new homeowner. And that's the purpose of the attachment. Now what happens when you do get the judgment? You're going to court, the person has no defense, they don't show up, you get a judgment. The court then issues you an execution and an execution is an order from the court directed to the sheriff. And it specifically says, go and seize the goods of the debtor and pay off, pay it to the creditor. Uh, the way it affects real estate is the, the sheriff comes into the registry of deeds and records the execution. That doesn't sell the house, but it's like a, another type of lien. So um, if you're interested in a particular, like let's say that there's a house in your neighborhood that's kind of run down and you're concerned about what's going on with it <clears throat> and you figure out who the owner is and you type the owner's name into the registry of deeds website and a couple of documents come up that say execution. Well, that means that that's a pretty good indicator that the owner of the property is in financial difficulty. And so it's probably not a lot of good things are going to be happening to the property. Um, similarly, federal tax lien, state tax lien, uh, you don't pay the IRS, you own real estate, they'll record a lien against your property. You don't pay the DOR, Department of Revenue, they'll record a, a lien against your property. One thing that's important to understand is that the registry of deed system is a name-based system. It's not an address-based system. And that's partly because when the first registry of deeds opened in Massachusetts about 400 years ago, there was no street names and there were no street addresses. So the system was based on who owned property. We do put the address of properties in the records now, but you should only use that as sort of a, um, a breadcrumb trail to find out who the owner actually is. But when you're doing your serious searching, make sure you do it by the name of the owner because uh, a federal tax lien, a state tax lien, an attachment, it's against all the property owned by the creditor, by uh, the debtor. And um, so we don't even put an address in the property. So if you only search by address, you're likely gonna miss any liens that are recorded. And finally, in this slide, UCC financing, that's the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, if you open up a pizza restaurant and you buy an expensive pizza oven, the person that sold it to you is want, wants a security interest in that. Even though it's going to be attached to the real estate, they'll file a, a financing statement at the Registry of Deeds. Where this, there's been an explosion in UCC financing statements recorded because of solar panels on rooftops. So if you go to Solar City and get them to um, install panels on your roof, they're gonna record a financing statement against you and your property at the Registry of Deeds. Now it's no big deal. It's just to protect their property that's up on your roof. 
Um, but you should remember that if you do have solar panels and it's coming time to refinance or sell your house, you're going to have to take into account those panels. It might mean getting a, a release from Solar City um, and then recording the mortgage and then having Solar City record the document over again. Uh, but my experience is that a lot of people who get these panels, and I know they're all over my neighborhood, don't actually realize there's something recorded at the Registry of Deeds about it on their property. And like I said, it's no big deal. It's just that you should be aware that it's there. Trusts, uh, this could be a whole separate thing. The essence of a trust is split ownership. The trustee owns legal title to the property, but owns it for the benefit of the beneficiary. Uh, it's used in estate planning a lot. In the Registry of Deeds records, it's the name of the trustee that's listed. It's not the beneficiary. That's kept confidential. Um, just a couple other terms. An easement is a right to use land for a particular purpose, uh, often to pass back and forth over it, like the cows in this picture. Um, if you own the land that the cows are standing on and you say, hey, Mr. Farmer, I, I thought I bought this. Why are you letting your cows walk over my land? The farmer says, well, if you look at the deed, I reserve the right to have my cows pass back and forth over your land to get the, the, the grazing field. Well, that's an easement. Um, more often, it's an easement to drive back and forth across property. It could be the electric company to, to run wires or uh, uh, the sewer company, or the, the city to town to put a sewer line under your property. Adverse possession is um, long open use of property can ripen into possession of property. So if you have a big parcel of land and somebody goes on it and builds a house and lives there and they're doing it out in the open and they've done it for more than 20 years and nobody's told them to get off or that they have permission um, they could make a case that they have now acquired ownership of the property. This is very rare. Um, it comes up once in a while, like if you all of a sudden discover that uh, your neighbor's fence is 10 feet on your side of the property line and that it's been there for generations, uh, the neighbor might claim that uh, he's acquired ownership of that 10 foot parcel through adverse possession. But it's really hard to prove, and um, but it's a term you should be aware of. And the last thing I'll talk about before questions is um, we don't have plot plans at the Registry of Deeds. A plot plan is a, a small sketch that shows the footprint of a building and the outline of the lot that it's contained on. Uh, you usually get one when you buy the property or when you refinance. The lender requires it. Uh, as evidence that that you, nothing encroaches on your property or that your house is within the property line. Um, it, it comes up often when people are putting on a deck or a fence or a shed and the building inspector says, well, bring in a plot plan. I can't give you a building permit till I get your plot plan. And uh, people go to the registry of deeds. We don't have them. They don't get recorded. We do have subdivision plans which are created when a larger parcel of land is divided up into smaller building lots. But because that's done when the lots are first created, there's typically never anything built on them at the time. And so they don't show the um, buildings upon the lots. So they're not a real good substitute. So that's what I've got. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this point. Okay, so um, there's a follow-up on a question from earlier about the conflict of interest laws in Massachusetts. Start your chuckling. Um, what does the law say about who has a real estate conflict of interest? I don't, I don't think it says anything specifically about real estate conflict of interest. It, um, it just has a conflict of interest, and I, I think that um, that comes down to whether you or someone to whom you're related would um, has an interest, a financial interest in some 
action you are taking pursuant to your governmental office. Um, so like if I was a Lowell city councilor and um, the city had a lot that was declared surplus and I had to vote to sell it, if it was my brother who was the purchaser, the potential purchaser, and I voted to sell him the property, um, I think I would be in violation of the state ethics law, even if he was buying it for the fair market price. But because there's either, there's a conflict of interest or a perception of the conflict of interest, because a relative of mine has a financial interest in this transaction, I cannot participate in it. So that's, that's how, that's the way the law addresses it. <clears throat> Okay, um, thank you. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so thank you so much for being here and helping us through all of our various real estate <laughs> conundrums. And um, thank you everybody for being here. We really appreciate it and hope you got something out of it. I will send out that YouTube link soon. And maybe we can have Dick Howe back at some point to talk about homesteading. Yeah. And again, that it's uh, and thank you all for your attention and your participation. And the, the email address is Lowell Deeds with an S at the end at Comcast.net, and uh, that comes right to me. And I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. But thanks again for having me. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Dick. You're welcome. Bye bye.